Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah show kicks off this hour. Our first email comes in from Michael. Michael writes in and says, Hi, Noah. I have a VPS that's acting a bit strangely. The following cycle has happened several times, but I'm only showing the versions from today's activity. When I run sudo apt update and and sudo apt upgrade, the following packages are included in the recommended upgrades. Linux headers 5.4.072, headers 5.4.0.72 dash generic uh, images, and then dash generic modules, dash generic modules, dash extra, dash generic. If I run sudo apt auto remove, the older versions of those packages, 5.4.066, etc., are removed, totaling around 360 megabytes. Fine, but Linux upgrades on my other servers without having to manually clear the old packages. And despite 72 versions of packages being installed on hostname CTL, only shows Linux 5.4.0-70 generic. I'm also stuck on version 5.4 of the kernel. Running sudo apt dist upgrade reports nothing to be upgraded. This server is running Ubuntu 20.04.2 LTS, but my server running Ubuntu 16.04.7 LTS automatically upgraded to Linux kernel 5.10.13. Yes, I know I need to go back and upgrade the 16.04 server this month. How do I get the Linux kernel updated on my 20.04 server and not have to manually clear the old packages going forward? If I manually download the current mainline package and install using sudo dpkg Tack I, uh, will that solve my auto remove issue or should I just stay on version 5.4 for some reason? Cheers, Michael. So I have a couple of thoughts on this. I'm also going to bring our interactive Jitsi room in, which you can join by going to geeklab.ninja and then clicking on the widget in the top. Hello, guys. Well, that was uneventful. Hello, guys. Hi. There we go. Hello. Hello. Do, um, Hello. Does anyone does anyone have an idea of what would be going on with this 2004? You know, it's funny when I first read this, I thought to myself, "Oh, I remember a bug with 1604 in which the boot partition would get filled up and you'd actually run out of space and you had to crawl in there and remove the old kernels before you could update." And it was funny that that was on 1604, but I've not had any issues on 24. How, how about you guys? Have you have you seen this before? Has have anybody come across this? Uh, so I haven't specifically had this issue on on Ubuntu 20.04, but I think that's mostly because I haven't tried to use anything other than the the default kernel that's available for uh, um, uh, for Ubuntu 20.04. Uh, as far as I'm aware, you don't actually like Linux 5.10 is not available in any of the standard kernel flavors. That, that Canonical ships for any Ubuntu LTS release. So I'm not entirely sure where that comes from. Mm -hmm. But what I can say specifically is that if you're trying to get to newer kernels um, with Ubuntu re in any Ubuntu release on any Ubuntu system, you most likely need to, you need to tell, uh, you need to run the Ubuntu drivers program or you, mm, sorry, Ubuntu drivers is if you've got official hardware that uses it. Um, if you are, uh, if you're running, uh, and you're seeing only the standard kernel, what you might want to try is to install, uh, the Linux dash generic dash HWE dash 20 dot four, um, package, because what that does is it switches you over to the rolling hardware enablement stack, uh, for based on the 2004 series. I think there's actually a more generic way to do this uh but i can't find it off the top of my head so like the what i i guess what's unclear to me is what this person is expecting if they're expecting to have 
the hardware enablement kernel um, on all their servers and desktops and whatnot, or if they're expecting to have you know standard supported kernels and they expected the standard supported kernel to go up a version. For the 1604 box that you mentioned, uh, it doesn't seem the version that he that that person says is there is not provided by Canonical at all. So that person got it from a third party source somehow. And that needs to be that whatever third party source that person is using for that kernel, that probably needs to be set up on the 20.04 box, assuming that it's available for 20.04. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, is there any value in running apt get clean? And just well, try to app get clean doesn't do anything other than it cleans up like metadata files. You you do probably so Debian based systems do not have the ability to uh, to auto clean up um, old kernels like RPM based systems do. So you do need to find a time to do um, the purge kernels. I think it's called purge kernels. I forget exactly what the command is called, but there's a purge kernels command that you can use to clean up old kernels. And you need to do that, um, I would I would say probably once a year, because by that point, you've probably accumulated like four or five, six kernels. And if you run out of space um, in your boot partition, assuming you've got boot separated in a server configuration, um, or if you just run out of space on your root file system, that's an easy way to clean up a lot of space. Like you probably just have a ton of old kernels. Um, so you should be doing that regularly. That That's um, just pseudo apt auto remove, correct? No, that purges no, no, no. Old kernels, does it not? No, not reliably. Auto remove is special because what it does is it looks for anything that fits with the depend with the immediate dependency graph around certain packages and sees is it a leaf package? Is it was it user installed? Uh, does it have satisfy some other conditions? If it if it fits those conditions and it's not being used, it fits the condition of it was a dependency. It's not being used by anything, and it's a and it's now a leaf then it gets deleted. But kernel packages never fit this because they're always explicitly installed by the user. Uh, so they don't get auto-removed. If they do get auto-removed, something's gone wrong because somehow it thought it was installed as a dependency rather than as a main package. So uh, you need to run, there is a special purge kernels thing that you need to do for cleaning up old kernels. And you should do that regularly. Um, as far as anything else with this system, um, I would, I, I'm a little nervous that I don't understand where the kernels came from and what setup is in. Mm. So I would probably need more details before I could give like a more concrete solution for the problem in question. A typical kernel in the chat room in the Geek Lab says uh, maybe he could just go to getfedora.org and that would be the solution to upgrading his Ubuntu box. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, not going to uh, say no uh, to that, uh, but uh, if you need, if you need, uh, you know, stable platforms, then I would probably recommend uh, either CentOS Stream 8, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, or Alma Linux 8, and go with that instead. Uh, I did find um, sudo apt dash dash purge space auto remove is supposed to delete all unused old kernels. Does that Interesting. sound like... That doesn't sound like it's not supposed to work that way, but if if somebody says it does, Ubuntu well, is, this a, is a yeah, just a weird weird place. Our second email comes in from JJ. JJ writes in and says, "Hello, Noah. I run OpenSUSE Tumbleweed on my personal laptop so that I can get a faster release cadence for better gaming performance and newer features when compared to Ubuntu. I'm now experiencing an issue, and I would love some guidance. I leave my laptop to fall asleep." And when I try to wake it up, after a significant amount of time, the screen and OS refuse to wake up. When I leave the laptop open for a portion of time, the caps lock light flashes rapidly, and then the computer reboots to a new session. I remember before this issue started, seeing an error waking up from my computer and the sleep starting, stating that the lock screen is broken and asking me to enter a command in a shell. But I forgot the command to enter as the prompt disappeared. The issue does not occur when I click sleep in the power menu. It mostly occurs when I leave the device open and away from the docking station. The model is a Lenovo ThinkPad E595. And of course, any guidance you have would be appreciated. So I would start by telling you, I would, if, so there are two things I would check. I would, I would cat out, um, sys, uh, slash sys slash power slash state. 
Um, I would also try and look to see if you can get to logs. Even if the system itself doesn't respond, oftentimes or sometimes you're able to still SSH in uh, from, a, from a different machine. And so I would give that a shot. Obviously, if it actually is in a suspense, it's unlikely to happen or unlikely to, uh, unlikely to work. Um, the, the, one of the problems is when, when you're forced to reboot the system to make it come back, a lot of times you lose a lot of that troubleshooting, valuable troubleshooting information. And it can be difficult to try and nail down where that problem is. I will have linked for you in the show notes, which you can get at podcast.asknoahshow.com, a, um, a forum uh, thread uh, on the, uh, on, 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 from Arch Linux that discusses this uh, a very similar issue on a ThinkPad E595. And they uh, attributed it to, to, to I believe, uh, some of the video drivers. So I'll have that link for you, and you can check that out, see if that resolves your issue. If it doesn't, uh, come back, let me know. And we'll continue down the uh, the community troubleshooting path, as it were. Our third email, excuse me, our third email comes in from Simon. Simon writes in and says, "Hi Noah, I have a Samsung 60-inch plasma television with no smart features, two HDMI ports, one USB port, and I would like to put it to good use. Here's what I'd like to do: I'd like the ability to watch movies on it streamed from my Synology NAS. I'd also like the ability to watch Netflix and Amazon Prime." Access to a web browser to watch YouTube and other websites. I would like the ability to attend Zoom meetings. No camera is going to be required on my end, but I would like the ability to see the other participants, hear the other participants. Some basic Linux desktop application would be a plus. There is no way to connect it directly to the internet, so I'll need a device for that. The TV is located in the same room as my router, and so I could easily run an Ethernet cable to any device I choose. Based on the above, I think that I'll need at least a Linux desktop environment and a computer connected to the TV. What device would you recommend for my needs? And what Linux distribution is best for this setup? The most powerful Raspberry Pi or something a bit more powerful? What peripherals would you recommend to control it from a couch? Cost is not so much a barrier to me, so I'm happy to get what I need. Thanks for taking the time to answer my question, Simon. So, uh... This can get as complicated and fun as you want, or it can be as simple as you like, right? So you could start by uh, grabbing an NVIDIA Shield, and you could you know, that's kind of my go-to uh, for TVs. And so you could start there. Uh, now, it's not going to get you a Linux desktop environment, but it will get you uh, the ability to stream uh, content from your NAS. It is going to get you the ability to watch both Netflix and Amazon Prime. And you can install Chrome, so you'd have the ability to run a web browser and watch not well actually they have a youtube app too so you could use that or you could use the chrome browser to watch other video websites i'm not sure if anybody has released a zoom client for android tv and obviously like i say you're not going to get any access to a linux desktop environment um so coming down from the shield if you say to yourself nope that's not for me uh i want something different and i'll, I'll tell you where i started i started by building a home theater pc and i had that inside of our house what eventually made me move to the NVIDIA Shields was a two, two-pronged approach. First, the, the wife factor, right? When she comes in, she wants to be able to control the TV from the same remote that she controls the TV. She doesn't want to have to think about the fact that there's a computer attached to her TV, and so that requires a separate set of peripherals. When I come into the room, I want maximum amount of control, maximum flexibility, all of those kinds of things. I also want to be able to grab the remote from her and and be able to just control the TV, right? So I want the best of both worlds. And the Shield gets me there because it has two USB ports. And so it allows me to plug in USB peripherals and so I can use things like a mouse or a keyboard. Logitech has um, some really fantastic project uh, products in this uh, regard. They have a keyboard mouse uh, combo. And, and, and essentially the way that it works is it has a little trackpad uh, built into a very small keyboard. And the, the idea is that this is, you connect this to uh, things like your home theater PC, and it allows you to control and access uh, your system right from, from a keyboard that's ideally designed uh, to function in this kind of environment. And they're not very expensive. They're, I think they're only 30, 40 bucks. I'll have a link for you for that, for that Logitech uh, uh, keyboard. Um, it's actually a trackpad combo. Um, and and I I've seen these used extensively in uh, in home theater. So it's I believe the model is the Logitech K four hundred. Um, and yeah, they're just twenty five bucks, and it's it's kind of an ideal wireless solution for controlling a PC connected to a TV. Now again, you could make this a little bit more complex if you wanted to, and I'll explain how to do that. 
Uh, one of the things that you could do is um, oftentimes when we go into some houses, particularly uh, when you have houses that they want the the media display area, the living room or the home theater or whatever, to be separated um, from where the actual device is that's generating content, you can do that uh, by by it, by either running SDI cables and encoding it over SDI, uh, which is essentially HDMI without the copy protections. That's one way to do it. Um, the other thing is you could use Cat5 or Cat6 balance, uh, HDMI balance. And the advantage of doing that is you're running Cat5, a pair of Cat5 or Cat6 cable um, to the TV and then back down to wherever it is you want to store your machine. And then over that that pair, you're connecting a device that can that can send HDMI. And so what that allows you to do is when a new spec of HDMI comes out, you don't have to rewire your house. You just replace the balance on both sides and Bob's your uncle, you're back in business. Additionally, it means that all of the other things at like, you know, if you want a more powerful machine, you can have that more powerful machine uh, sitting downstairs in a closet in a basement somewhere else. And then you can use RF controls to be able to access that machine or control that machine uh, remotely. And so I've, I've never done it with a, with a keyboard and mouse. I've, I've typically done it with, um, with handheld remotes because most people that are interested in getting a computer out of their living room are not interested in using a computer per se. They want it to mimic um, a, a traditional AV device. Uh, and so we typically use uh, products from a company called URC or Universal Remote Control. And what they allow you to do is actually have a base station connected to a network. And then your remote actually can connect over Wi-Fi and send those commands down to the base station, which then, in, in most cases, is spitting it out over IR and controlling it. But you certainly could do something. Uh, you could certainly control your PC in a similar way as well. Uh, and if you, if there was a problem with, if you said, Hey, I really want to get that keyboard and mouse, uh, to work, then you could run a, a USB extender or USB balance, uh, to do this. And and we actually put this up in our shop at Ultaspeed Technologies. We wanted the ability, um, to be able to put a, a, a computer at one place and have the technicians that are working on the bench, uh, be able to walk in there and access that machines. And there was quite of a distance between the two. And so that's what we did. We ran uh, HDMI balance and we ran uh, USB balance. And so the computer would have a little USB port that you plug in and an HDMI cable you plug in, you go to a totally separate room and you were able to control and interact with that PC. Um, and so that, that I, I tell you that because, uh, you know, when you, when, when you start looking at if, if it has to go in the living room, right, there are some size constraints, there are some aesthetic constraints, all those things exist. And so if you go with the best Raspberry Pi out there, you're probably going to have a pretty reasonable experience. I find that uh, the latest gen uh, Raspberry Pi with Ubuntu Mate uh, has excellent performance. And for basic day-to-day -day computing tasks, I, I don't really miss having a, a full-fledged computer. But when you start getting into, I want to do a video conference, and I'm going to have a couple browsers open at the side, and I'm you know, that's when I start to think, man, I'd really like to have an actual, uh, an actual computer connected there. And so I would, I would either suggest the, the NVIDIA Shield, a Raspberry Pi, or custom build like a home theater PC um, that you and your family can tolerate or put it elsewhere and then run cabling to it to, to handle that. I have, you know, in my, in my house, we have a, have, you know, TV in each of the kids' room and obviously my wife and I have one in our bedroom and in our living room. But there's one room in our house that's downstairs that doesn't have a, a shield connected to it as a full-on PC. And that room is by far my favorite place to sit down and, and just relax because it allows me to kind of explore the world the same way that I as a geek am used to doing that, which is through a computer. And um, really, if you think about it, the NVIDIA Shield is nothing short of a compromise of a computer. It's a computer that can do a subset of tasks. It just does them very, very well. So hopefully that gives you some insight and answers to your questions. If it doesn't, then let me know and we will uh, we'll continue to explore additional solutions. Vladimir writes in and says, hi, Noah, do you have any recommendations for a VNC client? I've been using real VNC for years to help family members. Is there a reason not to use their service? It hasn't failed me yet. Also, the Opinion Dominion was a great recommendation, but the interview with Andy Yen is especially good. Thanks for all you do for the community, Vladimir. So, Vladimir, what I would tell you is there's a couple, of, you have a couple of options. First of all, if you like real VNC, keep using them. They are the commercialized version of VNC. If we're going to take VNC as a product that was released in 2002, AT&T just released the research and said, here's what we can do. We can remotely control screens. If you're going to take that and turn it into a commercial product, real VNC is what would come out of that. Um, and so they're very popular. In fact, um, the radio station that I work at part-time 
He has used them for years to, to remotely control um, their workstation. So real fancy, nothing wrong with that. Um, if you're looking for alternative clients, probably my favorite client out there is Remina. And I like Remina for a number of reasons. Part, I partly like it because the interface is designed for people like me who have to access a bazillion remote computers in a bazillion different ways, a bazillion different times. And so when it's running, it's running down in the taskbar and I can simply right click on it and it gives me a list of all my sites. And if I hover my, my mouse over the site, it breaks it down into machines and I can connect to them, assuming I have a VPN connection, obviously. Um, and so uh, Remina supports RDP, it supports VNC, it supports SSH, it supports SFTP. It's a really fantastic client. In fact, there was even a plugin that I played with for a little while um, that allowed you to use X2Go. Um, and it's fantastic. So it's a really great pre piece of open source software. Uh, and, and if you're looking to get away from uh, real VNC for any reason, you could go to something like X2Go or you could just go to more open source implementations of VNC and you could use it that way either way. Again, phone lines are open 855-450-NOAH. It's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. Kyle writes in and says, hey, Noah, I'm looking to get rid of some old paper documents that I'd like to keep, but I don't want to take up any more physical room in my house. Do you have a recommendation for a scanner and software on Linux to accomplish this task? I'm okay with spending a few hundred dollars on a scanner if it's a quality unit that will last a long while and allow me to load multiple pages at once. Duplex, duplex scanning is a plus, and I'm fine with a larger hardwired desk unit. I don't need portable wand style scanner. Love the show. Thanks for all you do for the community. Thanks, Kyle. So you've uh, you've got a couple of options. So first of all, as far as software goes, I want to start there because uh, I, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Scanlight, S-K-A-N-L-I-T-E. And uh, I, I went through a similar process a few years ago where I just said, I'm getting rid of all paper copies. I'm taking pictures of sentimental things and storing the pictures and any documents, I'm going to scan them. Now, I went with an Epson flatbed scanner um, and primarily that decision was based on, A, I wanted compatibility with Linux. Um, but the other part of it was that I wanted the scans to be, I was concerned about the scans being high resolution. I was scanning everything from documents to photos and I wanted to find that nice in between um, where I really thought, uh, I, I was going to deliver a lot of really great quality. And so I, I researched a particular model of apps and scanner. I purchased it. It works great. I'll have a link for you in the show notes if you want to buy it. However, it doesn't support um, loading multiple pages. It certainly doesn't support duplex scanning. So if you want those features, they certainly exist out there. And there are scanners that uh, that do that off the uh, off the cuff. But the, the issue that I think you're going to run into is a lot of those scanners that, that have document feeders and support things like duplex scanning and those kinds of things are designed from the standpoint that those people are doing a tremendous amount of scanning and they're not concerned about following standards per se. They're worried about working with their proprietary software that they include. One way that you can get around that is to purchase a, a multifunction unit. And the reason that the multifunction units are helpful is not because, not just because that they have a, a document feeder on the top, to load the documents from, but because a multifunction unit typically will have a network interface on it. And if you purchase a multifunction copier, scanner, printer unit with a network interface on it, oftentimes what you'll find is the ability to scan a document directly to something like a Samba share. And so in large office environments, this is done all the time. Uh, they walk in, they walk up to the copier, they put the document on or a stack of documents on, they hit scan, it asks them what destination you want to go to. Typically, you'll map a couple of destinations for individual users, they tap on it, and Bob's your uncle, they go back to their computer and all the documents are there. Nice thing about that is it's essentially operating system agnostic, so you don't have to worry about it functioning with Linux. It's going to work regardless. As far as the wand style scanners, I agree with you, not a fan of them at all. If you don't, if you don't slide them over the paper exactly right, um, it skews the image, obviously. Frankly, I have better luck taking a picture with my phone um, than I have with those wand style scanners. So I'm, I'm all about getting a hardwired desk unit. Um, I, I think that if you're looking for native Linux compatibility, then you're probably looking at trying to get away from something that is uh, specific to an operating system. Hope that helps, Kyle. Our pick of the week this week is Open IPC. I am so excited about this. Open IPC is open source firmware for IP cameras. So the Open IPC is a Linux operating system based on the OpenWRT and BuildRoot projects that are targeting 
IP cameras with specific chipsets from different vendors. And uh, there's so we've talked about I, I don't I can't count the number of times that we've talked about cameras. Seems like cameras and networking come up almost reliably once a week on the show. And and so or somebody asks about them. And and the the, the thing that excites me about where we're going with cameras is for a long time everybody used analog cameras and when ip cameras first came out it was very proprietary it was very very brand uh, specific and if you purchased brand xyz camera you had to purchase brand xyz and vr and there were licensing fees and all sorts of crazy things that were associated with it then things like onvif started to come out and rtsp started to come out and 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 as those as those standards started to establish themselves, manufacturers slowly started to pull back from their, hey, you just buy this thing and plug it in. Uh, you know, and I, I've even seen a unit, it was so bad. It was, uh, it, was a, it was a unit that the cameras plugged directly into the back of the NVR. The NVR provided PoE power, and there was virtually no configuration you could do of the camera. It's just if the NVR detected one of its brand's cameras and it popped up in the NVR, and if it didn't, uh, then you couldn't use it. And so you were locked to that brand of NVR. You were locked to that brand of camera. And if anything failed, you were totally locked in. I mean, it was the antithesis of what I would recommend, right? And and over time, that's really changed. And so now you have companies like Geovision, you have companies like Axis, you have companies like uh, Unify, who all have manufactured cameras that can produce RTSP uh, streams of of their video and audio feeds. And so that means you can do things like pull a camera feed into OBS. You can pull it into any NVR platform that you want, be it a software-based solution or a hardware-based solution like we use with the Synology uh, surveillance station. All of those are pop are possible thanks to a shared set of standards. Now, OpenIPC takes that a little bit further. You may have recalled on previous versions of the show, we've talked about uh, a camera coming um, from the Pine folks and the people that brought you the the Pine phone and the Pine book. Um, and so it's, I believe it's called the Pine Cube and it is an open source camera. This open IPC is an operating system that takes heritage from the open WRT. If you're not familiar with that, it's the open source firmware that was designed for the Linksys WRT 54 G router so that you could have an open source router. Uh, fun fact, scale. One of the largest Linux conferences in the United States ran their conference entirely off of uh, OpenWRT, and it worked flawlessly. So taking that success and moving it into the IP camera space is very exciting to me. It natively supports IPI service support. It supports SquashFS, JFFS2, OverlayFS, SIFS, and VFAT. It has support for bridging, VLANs. Um, there is a tiny little SM, uh, SNMP daemon, so you can have it uh, report what's going on. Uh, th there's curl with SSL for uploading and downloading files. You can run arbitrary commands if necessary, so if you're trying to do something custom. I mean, this is just really cool, and they support low-cost 3G USB modems um, in Highlink and PPP modes, which would be useful if you're trying to put cameras out in the middle of nowhere. So, radio station I work for, one of the big things that we deal with all the time is if a station goes off the air, if there's a problem, somebody's got to go out to the transmitter site. Typically, people don't want gigantic antenna arrays and, and th tens of thousands of watts right next to their, you know, right next to their, their, their television set. And so transmitter sites are usually very carefully planned on where they put them. Um, and then there's a link from the actual radio station out to the transmitter site. But of course, that means that sometimes you're driving 20 or 30 minutes to get out there. And so the ability to just get eyes on at a location, say, what's going on? Oh, it's flooding. Oh, look, it's their snow is blown in. Oh, look, you know, that the power's just gone out. Whatever the answer is, um, that can be super valuable in the troubleshooting process. And the ability to tie that to LTE modems or 3G modems means that you're not necessarily dependent on internet connection. And if it's a small enough camera, oftentimes you can get away uh, running those off of a UPS. And so you can still have eyes on your site, even if the rest of the place has gone down. Um, and so really, really cool that somebody that somebody has worked on this. Open IPC, again, is the name. You can learn more at openipc.org, openipc.org slash about. Uh, just a very cool project and something I plan to keep my eyes on. Our gadget of the week this week is inspired from a question that was sent in from a viewer a few weeks ago. It is the HID Entry Prox 4045 CGNU. Now, when you're looking at access control, there's undoubtedly some of you out there that have listened to the show and heard me talk about access control and you say to yourself, but Noah, I know I've heard the story about you putting access control in your house and then your wife got locked out of the house and then you told her that she should carry access credentials and she didn't think that was too funny. 
My wife would never, I'd never get that far because my wife would say, you're not running wires all over the house. You're not cutting things out of the door left and right. We're certainly not going to have all these, all these wires, you know, attached and all these readers all over the place. Ridiculous. You're not doing it right. That, That could be something that you might come across. Or you might say to yourself, I don't have the, you know, $2,000 $2,000 it would cost to buy a really nice proximity system, a really nice access control system. And then I don't understand how to wire anything. I don't understand how to enroll the cards. And by the way, I don't want to use any Windows software. Didn't you just say last episode that, that there's there are very few of them that support uh, built-in web UI? I think you identified one or two and I don't want to do that either. What, what can you do for me? So here is a product I came across and it just almost fell off my chair when I saw this. It's so cool. So what this does is it provides a single door proximity access control. It's a single unit and it, it is designed for small installation or remote installations. And so essentially what you do is you take, you take the device out, you mount it, you attach it to whatever lock control you want to use, so a strike or a magnet, and then you program the device right there on the keypad. So they, it comes with the master pin, you type in the master pin, and then you have the ability to enroll users. Now users can either enter in a pin to enter the access control area, they can swipe a card, or you can have two-factor and do both. You can remove users right from the pin pad. You can wipe the whole thing right from the pin pad. And the only thing you got to power is 12 volts. So you can buy yourself a little electronics power supply or get yourself a little 12 volt wall wart and power this little unit up, mount it right next to your door. And then, like I say, figure out what kind of door controls you want to use. And Bob's your uncle, you're, you're, you're off to access control. And because it's made by HID, that means it supports the HID Prox Card 3, which if you'll remember from the... Uh, from the last episode is one of the most universal credentials that you can have. Now I'm working on getting somebody uh, on the show that that we can dive into this a little bit more uh, deeply because there's there's some cool stuff coming to the access control industry and it's and and a lot of it is based on open standards. The standard that came out in the 1980s and kind of has carried us through up until this point has been the Wiegand standard. Um, and there's a new sta- but the problem with it is it's it's inherently insecure because it's vulnerable to replay attacks. It's, it's the same information getting transmitted over and over again. By the way, it's not encrypted. And so if you have a pair of alligator clips and you know what you're doing, you can record the information being sent from the reader back to the controller and simply just play that back and uh, gain access to a door. Um, so that's been resolved now. They, they, there's, there are new technologies out. One of them is OSDP, which is a newer protocol that allows you to encrypt uh, the credentials before you're sending it across the wire. And so as some of that stuff comes out, um, it obviously alleviates a lot of these security concerns and makes access control even more valuable. The, the best part about the, um, the entry proc system, though, is when if you skate down the road. So you put one of these on your door and you say, hey, this is really great. Now we can enter with a pin or we can enter with a prox card or whatever. It's great. Skate down the road six months, eight months, a year, whatever. Hey, Now I want to go back and actually put in access control. How do I do that? Well, guess what? The entry prox can stand as a regular access control reader, and you can just connect it to any OEM controller. So very, very, very cool device. The entry prox, it sells for $200. I have a link for you in the show show notes at podcast.asknoahshow.com. If you're looking to get into access control and you want it to be platform agnostic and you want the ability to just buy one device and use it, you don't want to run wires all over your house, this is the way to do it. Check that out. Uh, I'll have a link for you in the show notes on where you can purchase one. Well, sometimes it's a slow news week that has not been this week. The the internet is on fire about a series of patches that have come out of the University of Minnesota. Now, I want to open by with a quote. One should not attribute malice that which can be adequately explained by incompetence. And if you take nothing else away from the rest of this discussion, I would encourage you to reflect on that quote, and here's why. We have a serious, serious gossip problem in the Linux community. I would define gossip as any conversation with an individual that has no hope of offering any resolution. And so when something comes out, we don't have productive discussions often. It's a lot of finger-pointing, blame it's just a lot of junk and I don't like it and it bothers me. And so I started down a track uh, earlier this week and, uh, and, 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 and figured out pretty quick that I was off base and, and have since kind of dug in to, to really understand this. And I, I, I want to lay this out because I think it's important that we get this right. In August of 2020, the University of Minnesota conducted a research project. And the idea of this research project 
was that they were going to try to submit patches with knowingly bad code for the purpose of proving that you could get patches into the Linux kernel. The big problem here is they broke the golden rule of security. And every single time we've talked about penetration testing on this program, security on this program, the first thing we say every time, make sure to get consent. And they didn't ask permission. They didn't get consent. And so what follows fell apart pretty quick, but that is the key issue. Now, the University of Minnesota claimed it was because that they didn't want the kernel developers to be on the lookout for bad patches. Hey, if we go to you and tell you, hey, we're going to conduct some security research, so uh, just be on the wear. You know, we want to be on the up and up, and so we want you to know that this is what we're doing. We're going to try and sneak some code in there, and then they're just on the look for the code, and then they knock it back out, whereas a real bad actor wouldn't be doing that, right? They wouldn't announce the fact that they're going to do something bad. They would just do it, so it wouldn't be a real test. The, the, the problem, though, is that this created an unmitigated mess uh, for a lot of people. So, and I'm going to butcher these names. I'm going to try to get it right. Kushi Yu and Ariana Paki and their graduate advisor, Kanji Lu, an assistant professor at the U of M Computer Science and Engineering Department, set out to see if they could submit bad patches to the kernel and get them accepted. Now, these patches, which were called hypocrite patches because they're designed to introduce bugs or problems into the kernel while masquerading as fixing problems in the kernel, albeit they attempted to not do anything too bad, um, they, it, it's widely known and it's widely accepted that the Linux kernel maintainers are overwhelmed and have been for quite some time. The, nobody, nobody expected the Linux kernel and the, the Linux project to gain the amount of significance uh, and, and world domination that it has. I mean, it's just a massive project and it's still run essentially as a community project, albeit a really large community project, right? They don't have time to scrutinize every single patch. It would be nice to believe that every character submitted to the Linux kernel is carefully gone over by the fine tooth comb and uh, by one person after the other. But the reality is they just don't have the manpower to do that. And so to a certain degree, they rely on the reputation of the people submitting the patches and they rely on some community support. And a large part of where we get a lot of work uh, in general in life, not just in, in the technology space, not just in the Linux world, just in general, this is true of medicine, it's true of technology, is universities. Because universities, the value to the person doing the research is learning the process of the research and understanding how all of that works. And so a lot of times industry can get some benefit um, out of those people doing the research. And so that, it's to the best of my understanding, is really what the Computer Science Department of University of Minnesota was set out to do. Um, but the, as you might imagine, the Computer Science uh, Department does a lot of projects, and many of them have been submitting patches for years to the Linux kernel. And so when it's hard to distinguish sometimes what patches or what code is coming from what people and under what project. One of the other projects that they've worked on since then, again, I want to be clear on the timeline here. This was past August 2020. We're into April now, 2021. One of the other projects that they're working on is a project called Static Analyzer, which automates the process of analyzing code and makes suggestions on you know, what we would fix. The mistake going around here is, and it's being perpetuated by a lot of people, is that the the research that was conducted in August, they got their hand slapped and said, hey, uh, we don't appreciate being tricked and having bad code sent in. And this April project that w was admittedly bad code, um, but wasn't submitted with malicious intent. And the problem in the kernel def developer's defense is they have no way of knowing that. They look at code and go, here's more code from a place that already admitted they were doing shady things. And look, here's more nonsense code. We're sick of this. We're sick of this. We don't have time for this. And so what happens? They get banned. And that has now set off. Everybody on the internet has picked a side on who they're mad at and who's right and who's wrong and all those things. The... The, the reason that Static Analyzer was confused for code under the Hypocrite project was because the, it produces terrible results. It's not good code. In fact, it's one of the things that Greg Cage came out and said was, hey, not only do we not know, when you produce bad code, when your software produces bad code, that's not our responsibility. That's your responsibility to figure that out. 
But the patch in April was a, was a result of the Static Analyzer project. And this comes uh, to a breaking point when that code submitted under the Static Analyzer was rejected. And the submitter got upset. And then everyone jumped on him for submitting bad patches to begin with and then brought back up this idea of hypocrite code that and hypocrite patches that had been submitted thinking this guy they're still continuing this research right but they weren't the the project concluded in in august of 2020 and later on down the list uh, down the mailing list that got sorted out and it, it's well understood now and i think everybody's kind of on the same page the problem is a lot of people aren't doing the research to understand what happened they're just saying oh you u of m was irresponsibly doing this and they just continued even after they were told that they stopped and and and, and so that's problematic and so initially the kernel team comes out and says these patches are so bad you must be continuing with this terribly run research project um and so uh, because of that greg kh had ordered a, a review of all of the patches submitted by the university of minnesota and as they've gone through that, they've actually found 50 or so patches that they said, hey, this is good. They they fixed things here. This is great. I mean, certainly there were some things that were, you know, a, a mistake. Um, 22 percent of their total submitted patches uh, were problematic. Now, that includes, um, to the best of my understanding, it includes both things that were intentionally submitted uh, um, as bad code as well as honest mistakes. And the, the on the mailing list, they're quick to admit, hey, you know what? If we picked any individual or any group, you're going to find a percentage of bad commits. And, and in hindsight, looking back and being like, that was a bad idea. We shouldn't have done that. That's acceptable. It's the intent and the spirit that people are that people are judged on. And and so what ended up happening is that they've just broken and lost trust because nobody knows for sure what they're doing and they've since come out and they've issued an open apology letter and said listen we're really sorry we're really sorry we meant we were trying to improve the security of the linux kernel we wanted to better these things we wanted our students to understand how these works we thought that there would be a uh, it would be pretty easy to be able to slip this code into the linux kernel and uh, and and so we're very sorry about that but the the issue is that now the trust has been broken and the community reputation has been damaged and on top of that, there is a, again, there is, it's pretty well understood that, yeah, anybody can sneak code into the Linux kernel. When you get caught, you, you, all you've done is lost trust. You've not proved anything is different. We've known that bad code exists in open source, uh, because we have things like Heartbleed, right? And we watched what happened and we had an entire discussion about how we can go about fixing those things and having some more oversight and getting some more eyes on code. Now, if you look, the response to that in large part was things like the Linux Foundation started initiatives, started putting money in a large, a, a lot of major players that rely heavily, their business model relies on the Linux kernel, started uh, contributing money to get more eyes on code, to get some audits and reviews and those kinds of things. And those things actively help and they push the needle forward and they further security and they further the development of the Linux kernel and they resolve problems. So their original intent at the University of Minnesota was to publish a paper on how easily you could slip hypocrite patches into the kernel and present this at the 42nd IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy at the end of May. And uh, when they got caught submitting these bad patches and called out and now banned, um, the, the what ended up happening is they, uh, they pulled the talk and they pulled uh, the research paper, which is appropriate. Um, what the, the messaging coming out of the Linux kernel community uh, is we don't have time for this. We don't have time to go through and play your mind games. And the biggest thing that you did was you didn't chase after a technological issue. You didn't demonstrate a technological failure of the Linux kernel. You didn't show some existing bug and, and how you, it could be exploited. What you did was you tried to trick humans by lying to us. You tried to trick people that are overworked and underpaid. A lot of these people are are working on the Linux kernel or or reviewing code commits on their own time. A lot of them are not being paid for it. They're doing it on their own dime. And so to lie to those people and say, here, I'm helping you, but really I'm trying to trick you is not furthering security. And again, biggest problem, lack of consent. 
if they had gone through the process, the responsible process, even if they just let a few people in and said, hey, we want to see how this works so that somebody was aware of it. And there was documentation on here are the codes that we submitted with intentionally bad codes. Here is the, the here are the things that we you know, everything else is, is, is correct. That wouldn't have been so bad. But there was, very, to the best of my understanding, there's very little documentation on which ones were, were intentionally bad, which ones were good. There's very little communication going on saying, hey, now we're trying this other project, and so is this code good? Is this, is this working out with the static analyzer project? Is that producing good results or not? And there, there was a lot of miscommunication there. And because of that lack of trust and because of the willful intention uh, to deceive people, um, understandably, uh, they just put a halt to it and said, we're done. We're done accepting uh, commits from you until you go back and 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 meet these lists of demands. Now I'll have the article linked for you. ZDNet claims to have a copy of that leak letter. I couldn't find the original. Um, so, but I'll have the 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 um, the the Linux Foundation's uh, list of of demands linked for you in the show notes of podcast.asknoahshow.com. But again, this research didn't do much to resolve the issue. Rather, it's it's kind of like kicking a man when he's down. These people feel overworked. They feel underpaid to begin with. They're trying their best to maintain the world's largest operating system. And and, and then you have people that are, are essentially trying to make fun of them, right? The idea that you'd go and, and, and write a paper and then go and present a paper without anybody's consent, without anyone's knowledge, and say, look at how bad the Linux kernel is run. They can't keep track of it. Well, guess what? They already know that. They already know that they're underworked and that they don't have enough manpower. What would be helpful is if you could provide additional oversight or additional eyes or, hey, here's how we could fix some of these things. Now, in the defense of the University of Minnesota, they had some proposed uh, solutions to this. I have not read what they are, but they didn't get consent. And there is a board. Uh, and after they were called out on this, they they went to the IRB and asked for permission and said, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we want to do. But that already came after they shared the paper's abstract on Twitter. So it was kind of like too little, too late. And again, the biggest thing is you've already broken people's trust because you've already lied to them. Quote, experiments on people without their consent is unethical and likely involves many legal issues. And I can tell you, as a company who does security uh, analysis for other, for other firms, uh, we don't touch anything without a written signed contract stating the exact scope of what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, what we think we're going to find, and how we're going to present that information when we find it. And if you don't have that, you have no business conducting security research because there's nothing to separate you from the actual criminals, from the actual people that try to do malicious code. I'm not saying that's what happened here. I'm saying that's what the problem is. So now you have Linux developers and committers who are burning hours and hours and hours. They're already trying to cram a 12-hour day into eight hours, and now they have to review several hundred U of M Linux kernel patches. They're not real happy about that. And to make matters worse, again, the internet has kind of, they've kind of chiseled off onto two sides. And there's the, the U of M or a bunch of knuckleheads. And then you've got the other side of people that are saying, you know what the real knuckleheads are, are the people that are maintaining the Linux kernel. They can't keep track of all this stuff. And all they're doing is making ex excuses for the fact that they can't defend against, you know, malicious code that's willfully submitted. And I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's an accurate summation at all for a couple of reasons. First of all, they did catch it. Second of all, again, this is nothing new or exciting or, or, or shocking. We knew that we want more eyes on the Linux kernel. We just struggle to find the actual solutions for this. But kernel developers, they have enough problems. They have enough, they have enough, they have enough to occupy their plate fixing real bugs and real problems and things that were added by mistakes. And so patches that have intentional bugs or are otherwise problematic, not good. Not good. Jonathan Corbet uh, in, at LWN noted, uh, quote, so perhaps the real lesson to take away from this whole experience is the speed of the kernel process is one of its best attributes. And we all depend on it to get features as quickly as possible. But the pace may be incompatible with serious patch review and low numbers of bugs overall. For a while, we might see things slow down and a little bit as maintainers feel the need to more closely scrutinize changes, especially those coming from new developers. But if we can't institutionalize a more careful process, then we will continue to see a lot of bugs and it will not really matter whether they were inserted intentionally or not. Quote, a look at the full set of U of M patches reinforces some early impressions, though. First is that almost all of them address some sort of real, even if it's obscure, hard to hit problem. And there was a justification for writing the patch. 
while many of these fixes showed a low level understanding of what the code was doing and thus contained many errors, it seemed unlikely that any of them were malicious in their intent. And so I have all of the articles that I use to put this together so you can verify everything that I'm saying. Um, but the, 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 the TLDR short synopsis here is they did a bad thing. They got called out on doing a bad thing. They stopped doing a bad thing. Later on, they did another bad thing, unintentional. It was attributed to the first bad thing, and then everyone got mad. And that's really kind of unfortunate. Again, open phones this hour at 855-450. No, that's 1-855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. So Seuss is going public. Seuss, an open source enterprise software company with German roots, on Monday announced that its intentions to float on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange as it seeks fresh capital to invest in organic growth and acquisitions. Seuss will issue $500 million in new shares via the offering to pay down debt while the Swedish investment fund EQT, who uh, acquired Seuss in 2018 for $2.5 billion, will sell an unspecified further number of existing shares. So we'll continue to watch it as it goes out. Again, I, you know, when, e when um, EQT uh, acquired Seuss, I think I said then, I wonder how long before they get sold again. And it turns out it was like a year and some change. So again, I'll say we'll uh, note that for the record and uh, continue to watch to see when it changes again. Nextcloud and Open Project are joining forces. This is super exciting. Nextcloud, the world's most deployed on-premise content collaboration platform, and Open Project, the leading free and open source project managing soft management software, join forces for both Nextcloud and Open Project data sovereignty and open source are an integral part of their business strategies and thus the foundation for their alliance. The first step, a combined effort of the integration of open project in the next cloud dashboard where users can add an open project wizard to display the latest changes and the, and the projects work package with this. It offers users a view into ongoing projects and activities. Now they have a really short explainer video that I think does a really good job of summarizing that. I'm going to play that for you now. The Open Project and NextCloud integration will improve the productivity of their enterprise users. It combines the strength of the market-leading content collaboration platform NextCloud and the leading open-source project management software Open Project. The integration is available starting with NextCloud 20. It enables users to keep an eye on ongoing project activities directly out of their NextCloud instance. On the NextCloud dashboard, Users can add an Open Project widget to display latest changes to projects' work packages. Open Project information also can be included in the built-in universal search of NextCloud. The NextCloud notifications will be enhanced by Open Project's activities. A link can be added in the header navigation to directly lead users from their content collaboration platform to their environment for project management. Also, users can set up OAuth authentication for their Open Project instance. Further integration efforts are underway, which will deliver a NextCloud integration also on the Open Project side. Stay tuned and keep on collaborating. So you better believe the second I found out that was a thing, I got our uh, UltaSpeed uh, uh, ninjas working on that and said, hey, I want to play with this. This is cool. Um, we, we've used Dex to try to manage projects. And it works okay because you can delegate tasks and those kinds of things, but it's not a true project management software. And so the ability to add that into NextCloud and have that integrated right into the dashboard, absolutely fantastic. More information for you in the show notes of podcast.snoahshow.com. Audacity has been acquired. The company that already owns the music notation software and online catalog MuseScore and the Ultimate Guitar Community and Guitar Tab Catalog has announced its acquisition of Audacity, the popular free audio editing software. Together with its support of the assignment management platform Muse Class and song learning and effects app ToneBridge, the new company is known as Muse Group. It announced in a press release this week. In partnership with Audacity's online open source community, the new owners will be looking to expand the software's feature set and update its ease of use. Dedicated designers and developers will be tasked to work with the software, but Audacity will remain free and open source. If you've not used Audacity, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's probably one of the best audio editing software out there, um, partly because it's just 
a mean, lean cutting machine. It's so good at doing, uh, you know, basic audio editing. I don't know that I would use it if I was trying to do a, a very sophisticated multi-track uh, recording, although it does support multi-track and it works very well. The other thing that I, I appreciate about Audacity is anytime I've ever had an issue with it, if it does crash, if something does uh, go down or it does fail for any reason, uh, it always seems to recover very gracefully. So I don't lose audio and uh, use it to record virtually every interview I ever do. I use it to edit the show. Uh, I, I I don't have enough good things to say about Audacity, and so the fact that they're that that uh, the Muse Group is going to keep it free and open source, um, but is going to they they're planning on 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 introducing new features and and updating and upgrading everything, and so I think that's that's really exciting. Um, there's a lot of people in the professional industry that are slowly moving towards Audacity because, frankly, you know, there are proprietary alternatives out there and there are some advantages to having those. And so there are some use cases where you say, hey, I just I have to have X, Y, Z. But in most cases, most people can get away, even with professional level editing, can get away with Audacity. And it actually works really, really well. So the thing I like about it, I can get it on any machine. and I know it's going to be there. So congratulations to Audacity for uh for, uh, for getting a little bit of a lift. Hey, the music in my ears means we're out of time, but we record the show every Tuesday. It's live at 6 p.m. Central. You can join us at asknoahshow.com. Join the chat room at geeklab.ninja. You can download the show and the entire past catalog by going to podcast.asknoahshow.com. While you're there, check out the show notes. You'll have all of the articles and references I use to create the show. If you want the latest Follow us on Twitter at Ask Noah Show, me at Kernel Linux, and I'll see you next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central, asknoahshow.com.